Rise Up Nation to be behind us, man. And them tables turning and pose our will. No one will touch him. Jonathan Stewart houses it. Hey, I got old. Trying to see what happened around the league level. Trying to get in these playoffs. Yeah! What up, football family? Dan Helley, Lindsey Rhodes here with you. Less than three days away from kicking off the postseason, and the smack talk has already started in Nashville. We're going to have more on that coming up in just a couple of minutes. Yeah, first of all, eight teams playing this weekend were on the field today, though the Bills were missing a rather important piece. Their leading rusher and pass catcher, LaShawn McCoy who did not practice today because of a sprained ankle from Sunday that will likely leave him as a game-time decision for the Bills' first playoff game in 18 years. It'll be tough. Um, of course, he's a um, he's a special part of our offense, but at the same time, um, it's football. People get injured, and we have to have guys to step up. Uh, will it be more workload for me? Probably so. And I take on that opportunity to go out there and, and still put our team uh, and our offense in a good situation to win. Bills the road team in the early game on Sunday. Panthers the road team in the late game. They will be in New Orleans where they lost by double digits just five weeks ago. One of two games they lost to the Saints this year in the regular season. Carolina has never played New Orleans in the postseason before. And according to Cam, that changes everything. This is when the real football starts, you know, is explaining it to the young guys or the guys that haven't, you know, witnessed, you know, playoff football yet. This is this is where you, you you're made or broke. And, um, you know, I look forward to these type of moments because it, 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 it brings out the best in the individual because it's so much um, pressure. And we all know what they say about pressure does one or two things. And, um, you know, we're hoping to shine like diamonds on Sunday. I think overall they've been pretty consistent, you know. Um, I think uh, every team, just like us, you know, you probably look back on a few of those games and, you know, wish you would have done a thing or two different or felt like there was a play or two that would have made the difference. But, you know, bottom line is we're, we're here right now. We're both in the playoffs. You know, we're hosting them. Um, should be a good game. The second season underway in New Orleans and in Charlotte, where Tiffany Blackman joins us now with a few other ways that this matchup might play out differently than the first two. Well, Lindsey, quarterback Cam Newton, he's going to face Marshawn Lattimore for the first time since Lattimore missed those two previous games with injury. Newton says he plays with a lot of juice and that being a pro bowler speaks volumes. Look, per pro football focus, Lattimore has the second lowest passer rating allowed by a corner this season. And look, he's helped turn this Saints defense around. That is something that receiver Russell Shepard talked about. He noted that the Saints are more we're taking on the back end with Lattimore in the lineup. He said that you don't quite often see a rookie playing press man to man on third downs. And that says a lot about the Saints trust in him. He also noted that Lattimore is going to be matching up with Devin Funches. Funches, of course, has been playing quite well for the Panthers. He led them with 840 receiving yards and eight touchdowns this season. And of course, if the Saints try to take him out of the game. The Panthers have plenty of other weapons to get that ball to, like tight end Greg Olson, who Lindsey didn't play in those first two games uh, with that broken foot. Yeah, Greg Olson's return big for the Panthers, averaging 92 yards per game in his last five games against the Saints. Thank you, Tiffany. Take a look at the numbers. Cam Newton, Drew Brees, two games this year. Cam 0 and 2 against Drew. And you can see the numbers across the board much better for the older Drew Brees. Speaking of older, let's bring in our Hall of Fame quarterback, Kurt Warner. <laughs> I kid, I kid because I love. I'm wondering, uh, Kurt, if there's more pressure on Drew Brees because he is older and the window is smaller for him now, or if there's more pressure on Cam Newton. Well, make no mistake, uh, Dan, that uh, there's pressure on every quarterback come playoff time. And you know the quarterback position is going to have to play well if you're going to advance and make a run for the Super Bowl. Uh, but, but I'm going to say the pressure's more on Cam Newton. Now, if you're looking at the window to win championships, well, of course, maybe Drew. But I'm just looking at this scenario and the way these two teams have played this year. And 
Carolina just doesn't have the pieces around Cam Newton to think that he can have an off game and they're going to win. Uh, when you look at New Orleans, I mean, they've obviously got those two backs. I mean, the last time these two teams plays, those two backs accounted for 240 yards. So there's a lot of pieces there that can alleviate that pressure off of Drew Brees. And if he doesn't have quite as good a game, they can still win because they have more pieces. For Carolina, Cam has to play well, has to make plays both with his arm and his feet if they're going to advance. It's a great point. There obviously are some pieces there in McCaffrey and Olsen and Funches, but in that receiving core outside of Funches, not a whole lot of household names there. And if, if Cam doesn't play like we know Cam can, then they may not have a chance. All right, Kurt Warner, thank you very much. Off is under center, strong right. He launches. Sammy Watkins, far sideline. He made the catch. Are you kidding? Hey, you know how many points we have in the game? And with that touchdown, L.A. has already exceeded its point total from all of 2016. Robert Woods is a man on fire. Last side, Gurley on the screen, 20. Todd Gurley hits the Jets midfield. He's gone. Gurley for MVP. Let's go. They see that they can't, they can't block us in the pass, run. Donald and Quinn go back-to-back -back with L.A. sacks. Here comes the pressure for the Rams. Tremaine Johnson picks it off. Pick six, L.A. When you find a way to come on the road, finish up your road record, 7-1, and one, and win a division, there's only one thing you can say. Rams are back in the playoffs for the first time since 2004 with the league's number one scoring offense and a historical advantage that appears to go along with that. The last eight teams to lead the league in scoring all made it to the divisional round or further in the playoffs including last year's top-ranked offense, Atlanta, which happens to be traveling to L.A. this weekend. You know, the Falcons, I mean, we know obviously the quarterback was the MVP last year. They've got two really good running backs. The offensive line is really good. They've got maybe the best receiver in the league. So, uh, you know, they and, – and I think they're playing well. They, they've kind of hit their stride here at the end of the year as far as their offense is concerned. They front seven, you know, up front. Um, they're pretty good, you know. They're really good up front. Um, we can we can get after the secondary um, that they have over there, but you know it's on us. You know we just gotta have that mentality, go into the game, be aggressive, and you know uh, make plays when they present themselves. For more on the Rams, Omar Ruiz is in Inglewood, where LA hopes to be hosting lots of playoff games in the future. Thank you, Lindsay. Construction well underway, still on track for a summer of 2020 opening. Excitement building here. Excitement also building for the Rams, hosting that playoff game against the Falcons on Saturday night. Jared Goff about to face this Falcons team for the second time in his career. They didn't play him this season, but played him last year. These players are familiar with that personnel. Sean McVay hasn't coached against a Dan Quinn defense since the 2015 season, but they are familiar with the style and the scheme. They have faced seven times this season somebody from that Pete Carroll coaching tree, someone with the Seahawks in the division they are very familiar with. William McGinnis and Sean O'Hara with us now for more on this game. A good game in a number of different ways. Oh, so, yeah. Willie, help us focus. What is the matchup to watch here? Well, when you're matching up against a good team like the Rams, you want to take away one thing, and that's the MVP candidate, mm. Todd Gurley. you got to yeah. take him away. So the matchup is the Atlanta Falcons linebackers versus Ty Gurley. So I'm going to take you to week five when they play Seattle. And this is the way you got to take him out of the game or eliminate him. First of all, look at Bobby White. He's going to play the position of Campbell or Deion Jones. Set the edge. Frank Clark's doing a good job of pushing the line of scrimmage, but pursuit to the ball, making a big splash, getting to the play. And then look, nine guys in the box. Now that's by the Rams formation they got those players. But I want to pause it right here and show you something. Look at the wall. Nowhere to go. The edge is set. Gurley has to stop his feet, stop the momentum. They're able to make a play. So the two things that those two teams had in common, athletic linebackers that can adjust, that can run that place tough in the front. So when we go to the Atlanta Falcons tape, and I show you the similarities between the different linebackers and the players, here's Deion Jones. What's Gurley's biggest play of the year is the 80-yard screen pass. Watch Deion Jones diagnose this play. Beat the blocker, get to it, he eliminates the enemy. He's out of the game. He's done. That's yeah. Camara. That's not even the other guy. Literally out of the game. And then here's Campbell. This is the Dallas Cowboys. Here's a simple take two draw. He comes up, gets behind the line of scrimmage, tackle for loss. And then most importantly, you gotta be able to cover Gurley out of the backfield. 
Deion Jones wins the game. He's, he's matched up with a tight end. They can do it on every single phase of the game. That's why I think it's a good matchup in Atlanta's favor. Todd Gurley, the league's leader in scrimmage yards and touchdowns this year. So statistically speaking, he will be the best running back on the field this weekend. Yep. But will the Rams have the best running backs? Uh -oh. Sean O'Hara. Will you take us through the tail of the table? Ooh. What does that mean? Does that mean I get to, to walk? You get the move. You and talk. talk. Can you do them both? So this is like, this is kind of like. Oh. Be cool. He's getting cocky. Be cool. We're getting ready. Be cool. And in this corner, <laughs> we got a couple of NFC teams battling to keep playing and to go on to get another game check in the divisional round of the playoffs. <laughs> All right. The Rams taking on the Atlanta Falcons. I got my own little tail of the tape. I threw in a couple of little different items down here in the bottom. But let's start off with the quarterback. Now, look, I know Sunshine, Jared Goff, he's having a great year. But guess what? The regular season, I said it yesterday on Total Access. Just like they said in the, in the, in the show, in the movie Meatballs, it just doesn't matter. It's about the postseason. I'm taking Matty Ice because he's been we on agree. fire. We Last agree year in the playoffs, That's nine touchdowns one. and not one interception. So he, he's going to go on a heater again. Now, running backs, Lindsay, you started off asking me about this. Devontae Coleman, right? That's a mixture of Devontae Freeman, Freeman and Tevin Coleman. Oh, there Mix you them go, together. Okay. Yeah. Right? Combination. Well, guess what? There you go. Perfect you can call him Devontae Lizzie. Coleman, or you could just call him Todd Gurley. So I'm going Gurley here with the Rams. But, Sean, isn't that plural? It says backs, not just back. Yeah, but when, when you have Todd Gurley, it doesn't, doesn't matter. <laughs> let's, let's be honest. He should have been the NFL's leading rusher. He gotcha. took the week off. So not only did he lead the team in receiving and rushing, but he led the NFL. All right, wide receivers, I got to go here. I mean, I, it stops with Julio, but when you sprinkle in Sanu, and, yeah, I mean, look, I, I think that the fact that Gurley was their leading receiver as well, that kind of takes him out of consideration as much as I love Cooper Cup and Robert Woods. Pass rushers, game record, Eric Donald. Yep. Defensive tackle, leads the NFL inside at sacks, quarterback hits, and five force fumbles. Beast. Oh, yeah, he could wreck that game. I like him. Now, this right here could be the determining factor in the game. The special teams, all right? This is huge. The, the field shift, the momentum. I'm going to talk about a punter. Punters are people, too, huh? How about Hecker? 43-yard net punting. He's been the third best punter this year. And then also Farrell Cooper, the Pro Bowl special team. Kickoff nope. returner. He nope. ran one back. No, Greg Gerline, though. I see Greg the leg is not there. So nice walk the game huge. could come down to a kick. Way to go, to a big kicker, guy. But you don't want it to. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Did I win? I've got TKO? another edge. I've got TKO. another edge here. Uh -oh. Falcons have the edge when it comes I'm to players wheels. with playoff experience. Where are you going? Uh, I'm, 36 I'm on guys who have been there before <laughs> compared to six for the Rams. There's you only didn't... been one team in history that has that little playoff experience that has gone on to win the Super Bowl. Anyone know? They called their shot. Their quarterback called their shot. Uh, Name it. Jets. Broadway Joe. 1968. Jets, hey, ask Tony Richardson how to spell that Jets. Damn. <laughs> The Titans have 35 players who have never been to the postseason before as they make the playoffs for the first time since 2008. On the practice field today, once again without DeMarco Murray, who seems like a long shot to be ready for the Chiefs on Saturday. Without Murray, that means another healthy dose of Derrick Henry, who carried the ball 28 times for just 51 yards against Jacksonville last week, a performance Henry himself called soft. I could play a lot better, you know, um... That's what happened, how I played. But we got the W. That was the uh, that was main goal, and we got in. So, you know, just focus on getting better this week and being better than last week. What can you do better? Um, you know, uh, block and run, run harder. Um, um, not create negative plays. Um, be very detailed in the little things. And, you know, and that's what I've been working on this week, just trying to be better in, in every aspect that I can be. Well, that Titans playoff berth may have saved Mike Malarkey's job. Right now there are... Six head coaching openings in the NFL, if we're including the Raiders, although we know that John Gruden will eventually end up with the Raiders. Ian Rappaport, what else can you tell us about what's going on with those openings? Well, let's talk, Dan, about some of the key candidates here who are going to fill some of these openings. We'll start with one of the hottest every year, Josh McDaniels, the Patriots offensive coordinator at this point. He has three scheduled interviews. I'm told one is going to be with the Colts on Thursday, and then he's got the Giants and the Bears on Friday. Just considering the strength of these situations, this is expected to be the year that McDaniels comes out and becomes a head coach once again. Another hot candidate seemingly emerged out of nowhere. Steve Wilkes, the Carolina Panthers defensive coordinator, has five, seriously, five interview requests. Those are the Giants, Colts, Bears, Lions, and Cardinals. He seems at this point 
to be the bell of the ball. And then finally, Pat Shermer, another coach similar to Josh McDaniels, who's looking for a chance to get back in, just has wanted the perfect opportunity. We'll have all the opportunities this year. He has got the Lions and Cardinals. Those are set to happen on Thursday. And then he's got the Bears and the Giants on Saturday. All right, Rap Sheet bringing us up to speed. Thank you, sir. As we mentioned, John Gruden still employed by ESPN. He's going to call the Titans-Chiefs game this weekend. Gruden did appear on the network's morning radio show with Mike Golick and Trey Wingo and reiterated what he said yesterday to Bay Area Media about the Raiders opening. I think there's a good chance. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about where I am uh, in terms of studying the game and, and, and prepared to come back and coach. I just don't want to sit here and speculate, and it's almost like uh, um, I don't know what's going to happen, Mike. I gotta be honest with you; it's been a a long couple weeks. I know they've gone through their uh, process of interviewing candidates, and until they're done, I won't know. But uh, I did have a good meeting with Mark. I've known him a long time, and uh, got a lot of respect for the Raider uh, football organization. Steelers offensive coordinator Todd Haley returned to the facility today after suffering a hip injury. That injury reportedly happened during an altercation at a Pittsburgh bar on New Year's Eve. There has also been some speculation that Haley, who is normally on the sideline, could have to call the game from the booth. Buck safety T.J. Ward arrested in Florida for an outstanding warrant after he skipped a pair of court dates for marijuana possession. Ward was an originally arrested in October when officers discovered nearly 100 grams of wheat at his house when they were responding to an active intrusion alarm. Still to come on NFL Total Access. A lot's been said, a lot's been done to get here. A moment of truth in the NFC. The number four and the number five seat. Drew Brees. That leave. Second year back, Derrick Henry, who was especially hard on himself today. A week ago, he had 28 carries for just 51 yards. Twice today, he called himself soft. He said an outing like that sticks in his craw. And he said with that kind of output, he can't truly be a workhorse back. Now, of course, if quarterback Marcus Mariota can run the same way he did a week ago, that will only open up the run game for these Titans. Thank you, Aditi. 2.30 on the clock, yes. please. This is the wild card edition with Mac and Mr. O'Hara. Let's start with you, Sean. Uh, we call it the Irish pub. Right? This seat, you are, you are the Irish twins. Uh, bigger game coming up this weekend. Marcus Mariota, Alex Smith. Uh, Alex Smith. It seems like the obvious. Do I have to explain answer, right? why? Uh, we're going to make you explain like Mar Mar Mariota's really struggled. And, and when I went back and watched even this last week against Jacksonville, he just seemed tentative. He's not pulling the trigger in the red zone where he's been phenomenal. He's hesitant, taking a lot of sacks. But those deep balls by Alex Smith, how about that? Yeah, he's leading the NFL in pass already this year, but his deep ball accuracy has been phenomenal. It helps when you've got Tyreek Hill. You can just kind of hang it out there and let him run under it. But yes. uh, I like Alex Smith, and, and I think not just with Tyreek. Kelsey is, is a monster as well. That, that's been the big criticism on him the last few years, and this year he is taking the top off the defense courtesy of Tyreek Hill. All right, Mac, uh, should the Jags be concerned after losing their final two games to the Bills coming to Well, oh, absolutely, because of the offensive production. And as you talk about quarterback play, you want to peak – of having great quarterback play going into the playoffs, well, that's not Blake Bortles. You see him throwing more interceptions than he has touchdowns and just being in sync, his pocket play, his delivery, the timing, all the different things. Against Tennessee, when he had an opportunity with, what, two minutes or some chains left to go down and score, he couldn't do it. You know, it was three and out. They couldn't move the ball. And also, what's their main thing that they like to do? Run the football. They've declined the last two weeks. Three NFC South teams in the playoffs. Who's going to go the furthest? 20 seconds go. Mm. I'll take the Saints. Obviously, Drew Brees at home has been phenomenal in the playoffs, but how about their defense? What they've done since week two has been phenomenal. They're creating all kinds of turnovers. So I, I like the Saints getting after the quarterback and creating turnovers. I like you talking Marshall. defense. Yeah. I like you talking defense. The active leader in passing yards, Drew Brees, against the active sack leader, Julius Peppers. Uh -oh. This has only happened four times since 1982. The winner of that game goes on to the Super Bowl each and every single time. Mm. Willie, which rookie, and there's a lot of good ones there on is. Wild Card Weekend, which rookie is going to have the biggest impact? I look at the rookie that affected his team the most when he didn't have production or they didn't give him the football. That's Kareem Hunt. 
with the team you're talking Kareem about, the Kansas the City Chiefs. When they, went, when they went one and six out of the seven games, they didn't give him the football. He had limited touches, and he had zero touchdowns. Kareem Hunt opens up the entire offense. Those explosive plays you were talking about down the field, those multiple looks, if you don't feed him, if you don't get him the ball, it opens up none of that. You start to see a lot more read option stuff with Alex Smith because you're not saving it for anything. <laughs> you saw the number of forced missed tackles there from Kareem Hunt. Six 100-yard games tied with Todd Gurley for the most What else does he do? He, he, he leads the what? He leads the league in rushing. Yes, Nobody has more rushing yards than Kareem Hunt. After the break, it's another Kurt Warner Wednesday. But this week, we're going to change it up a little bit. Kurt's not giving us his best quarterbacks. Big announcements out of L.A. UCLA quarterback Josh Rosen announcing today that he is foregoing his final year of college eligibility and declaring for the NFL draft with a promise to his mom there at the bottom that he will return to get his degree. That was right before 4 o'clock Pacific time. 20 minutes later, the other L.A. quarterback made the same announcement. Sam Darnold leaving USC, also turning the page and becoming a professional. Will either of them play in the Senior Bowl later this month? That will be another decision for them to make. And that is where we start with trending presented by Hyundai with a Senior Bowl announcement about the coaching staffs announced today. It will be the Broncos staff on one sideline, the Texans staff on the other. Speaking of the Texans, their season is over, but two of their biggest stars are already working hard preparing for next year and looking pretty good considering they broke their leg and tore their ACL just three and two months ago, respectively. Also big on social media today, the announcement last night of the 15 Hall of Fame finalists, a group so good that Kurt Warner tweeted he was glad of the season. And for four months, we've been getting Kurt Warner's top five quarterbacks of the week. It is now time for Kurt Warner's top five quarterbacks of the season. I cannot wait to see who you pick because this couldn't have been easy, Kurt. <laughs> I tell you what, Dan, this was very, very difficult because there were so many factors that went into this. And I even have to leave a couple quarterbacks off that had great seasons. So honorable mention goes to Jared Goff and Case Keenum, who didn't make this list. But let's get into the guys that did. And number five, solely because his team didn't make the playoffs, is Russell Wilson. I thought he had an incredible year in what he was asked to do for this football team. I mean, 98 percent of their touchdowns on the year uh, accounted for 81 percent of their offense I mean it's just incredible if they had won a few more games and he had got a little more help he probably would have been higher but he gets the number five spot uh, for the year number four goes to Alex Smith I have no idea why we have forgotten about this guy he was so great early in the year. Yeah, they had that low where they lost some games in the middle, but still didn't play bad. I mean, he finished with 26 touchdowns and only five interceptions, the highest quarterback rating in the National Football League. Uh, he played great football this year, and it was unfortunate that he didn't have the pieces around him when he didn't quite play up to that level that they couldn't win those games, but he comes in at number four. Uh, number three on my list, Drew Brees. Um, I know people are going to say, well, his numbers are down from every other year that he's played and he hasn't thrown as many touchdowns, but I tell you what, he's played great football. And this is what happens when you put pieces around a great quarterback. They don't have to do as much from a stats point of view, but they still continue to win games. They spread the football around. He completes 72% of his passes. He gets the number three spot. Number two goes to Tom Brady. Uh, he has had another great year, uh, 40 years old. We've talked about it all year, how he's performed. Unprecedented for a guy his age. Uh, hasn't played as well down the stretch. And because of that, he's dropped to number two on the list. But still a great year. I mean, led the National Football League in yards. Uh, is right up there in touchdowns, which leads us to the number one spot. And that goes to Carson Wentz. Uh, this kid was playing at an unbelievable level before he got hurt. To think that he was only overtaken in the touchdown race the last weekend of the year. 33 touchdowns, finished second in the league. But it was the big plays that he made for his team on the way to leading them to the best record while he was playing, which puts him at the number one spots. Uh, played incredible football, and I don't want to forget about him just because he missed a, a couple games there at the end. Hmm. Very interesting. So if Carson Wentz is your number one quarterback, that means he must be the MVP in your eyes. 
<laughs> well, let's say if I was giving it to a quarterback, I would give it to Carson Wentz. And, you know, I thought Tom Brady was going to run away with this when Carson got injured, but Tom didn't play great the last month of the season, and, and he allowed the conversation to, you know, or, or Wentz to stay in the conversation. And if I look at how they played the totality of their year, I would. If I was choosing a quarterback, I would give it to Carson Wentz, even though he missed the last three games of the season. You're hedging it if you were choosing a quarterback. Is he your MVP or not? Well, I mean, again, it's nobody really ran away from it. Guys have been hurt. I, I wouldn't be surprised if another position took the MVP like a Todd Gurley or even an Antonio Brown who played incredible this year before he got injured. All right, Gurley, Antonio Brown, and Carson Wentz all in the mix. As we like to do, Kurt, we have to welcome the fans into this process and see who their final vote oh, is man, of the go. season. And how here about that their top two the exact same as you? Well, and I can't argue with Case Keenum, great year. Big Ben uh, obviously leading his team to that number two seed and, uh, and the record they had, not gonna argue there. But uh, you know, but again, Alex Smith, I think we forgot about him because they lost a few in the middle, had a great season. Um, you know, So again, hard to argue with any of those guys, but I, I really like my list. Yeah, I like your list too, fan list pretty good as well. So Carson Wentz, Kurt Warner's MVP, you heard it here on NFL Total Access. Thank you, Kurt. Kurt Warner's got his gold jacket. Let's see who's in the running to get one this year. The gold jacket finalists presented by K Jewelers announced last night 15 names, nine offensive players, five of whom played on the offensive line. I know Sean O'Hara loves that. Also notable here, Randy Moss. And pretty sure at least one of these names will. Ray Lewis widely considered a lock in his first year of eligibility. And you know John Lynch isn't hurting his chances the way he's nailing that GM job in San Francisco. If I could be so bold, allow me to suggest two new New Year's resolutions. The first is for good planning. You cannot miss the Panthers and Saints. The second is for good sense. You cannot call a rival quarterback a choker. Or can you? That's next on NFL. Good morning football weekend. Let's go! We're bringing the NFL to Saturday to get you ready for all of Sunday's action. He can put the ball anywhere he wants to put it. Good morning football weekend. Saturday at 9, only on NFL Network. Both AFC games are in the early slot this weekend. Titans, Chiefs on Saturday, Bills, Jags on Sunday. If the two AFC South teams want to face each other in the championship game, there will be this to keep in mind. The bulletin board material provided yesterday by Titans defensive tackle Jarrell Casey doesn't appear to be a huge fan of Blake Bortles. Oh, definitely. That's the game plan every year when we play against them. As long as Bortles back there, pick the ball game in his hand, he's going to throw. And, you know, we want to give him up the spot. We know we can We know we can put pressure on the front, and we know we can get the job done. So we, our job is to stop the run as, as much as possible and put the ball game in his hand. That was yesterday. Randy Moss is in Jacksonville today with Bortles' reaction. So as Bortles and the Jags prepare to play the Bills, Bortles is still getting trash talk by the Titans. Today here in Jacksonville, he was asked about Casey's comments. The players or peers um, talking about you is, is a little new. Um, you know, I've never been somebody that, you know, thought that was the way you should handle things, but, you know, guys are different. Um, I had a chance, fortunate enough, to play for George O'Leary in college. Um, and, and playing for Coach O'Leary, you learn very quickly how to uh, take criticism. So I, uh, I had four years of practice doing that, so um, there's nobody that can say anything worse to me than he did. <laughs> How many times did drugs in this Oh, daily. I got benched every other day. If it looks as if Bortles handles that criticism well, well, as head coach Doug Marone says, that's because he does. And it's also because, in the words of Marone, he's used to it. He's heard a lot of it. How is he going to be the player he wants to be if he starts listening to that stuff? Willie and I talking about this <laughs> during that. Okay, so Casey kind of backed off his comments after uh, they were out there tweeting, chill y'all, I was just typing our defense. And no, you wasn't. With the pressure, some QBs will choke. Willie says, no, he wasn't. Look, that, before I get into what my little cousin, Jarrell Casey, said, when you sit into these meetings, the first thing you want to do is take away the number one threat, and then you want to make other players have to perform at another level. They play 
in the same division as Clowney as well, and they've been in the same division for four years. Don't you think he's a little familiar with this quarterback and what he can do? And if I'm game planning against this quarterback, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to take away no. the run game, and uh, we're going we're gonna to put it in his hands. That's not what he's saying. He's saying Blake Bortles is choke. He has he's not. He's not saying okay. Blake Bortles is the person we'd like to have let me the ball. Be, let, me be crystal are... cl- let me be crystal clear then. When the game is on the line, and we've seen that this year against the Titans, and he had a chance to go down the field and do something, he either threw an interception or he was off the field on three and out. He has not proven that he can be consistently great in pressure situations when the game is on his back. So it, it is what it is. It's actually the truth. That's what, how teams think. He just shouldn't have said it. Why, do we, why does everyone feel like they have to say it about Blake Well, Morris? I know. That's the problem. And, and they shouldn't called say him it. trash. And isn't it kind of guys getting it every week? From isn't it every funny table? that he said, I, "I've heard, I hear this all the time." What does that mean? That he hears it all the time. <laughs> I wonder Clown- why. He just had to respond to Clowney calling him trash like a week ago. I got you. Back to the Casey Bortles uh, issue here. Casey's sack last weekend was one of five against Bortles in <laughs> eight head-to-head meetings. So he has had his number. He knows. Okay, Dan. Now, when it comes to the Saints offense and the Panthers defense, the number's pretty good for both of them. The no Saints trash here. top five in all these major categories in the Panthers defense. We know how good they have been. Uh, third in rush yards per game given up and third in sacks per game. So a potent offense against a stellar defense, maybe the best running back tandem in the league against the best linebacker tandem in the league. Can you break this down for us even further and tell us who has the advantage, please, sir? Well, I think the Saints offense, for how balanced they have been, you know, look, this is not the same Saints offense we've seen year in and year out where Drew Brees is throwing for 5,000 yards and they only run the ball to give his arm a break. This is a legitimate rushing offense. And, you know, I, I think this one of the things that, that you've got to do is you've got to stop the run game. Well, this matchup right here of Luke Keekley versus Alvin Kamara is going to be fun to watch. And, Helly. Luke Keekley is the best linebacker of the game, but it's not just the speed. It's it's look at the, the play recognition right here. Before the snap, he's pointing it out. He's moving over. He's beating Alvin Kamara to the point of attack right here. This right here is what the game is going to come down to. Now, Alvin Kamara, look, as a running back, 6.3 yards of carry between the tackles, but as a receiver, we know he's been so dangerous. Now, this is a screenplay right here. Luke Keekley sniffs it out right away, beats Max Unger to the spot. It's a big tackle. You're not going to have. Luke Keekley covering him one-on-one on a skinny post or wheel route. But that guy right there is going to be a big factor in this game. Can he shadow Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram? Can he, can he follow them in the run game? Can he sniff them out in the passing game? I think it's a tough matchup for Luke Keekley. I think it's one that, that you know he's going to have a big difference in this game. But I like the Saints offense as a whole because they can beat you so many ways. It's not just those running backs. And look, you get Luke Keekley sucking in on that run. Now you're going to beat him over the top. Michael Thomas, you know, he's doing what no other receiver has done uh, in their first two years in the league. They're so dangerous, and they've done a great job protecting Drew Brees. Ryan Ramchek, the rookie right tackle, has been phenomenal. I knew you'd get alignment in there at the end, as you should have. Listen, as good as Luke Keekley is, nobody diagnoses a play faster and gets from point A to point B faster than he does. They've still lost two games to the Saints this year, and the Saints yeah. have put up 31 and 34 points on that Luke, defense in two I games. am your father, Luke. We ain't saying. done yet. The Bills and the Jags. It's a matchup of the maligned. No playoff quarterbacks have louder critics than Blake Bortles and Tyrod Taylor. Tyrod will try to shut them up on Sunday. Out Shady McCoy, the league's fourth leading rusher, a non-participant today with a sprained ankle that could keep him out of Sunday's game. If he doesn't play, that would put a lot more pressure on the team's second leading rusher, Tyrod Taylor, who spoke with Kim Jones earlier today. Definitely happy about the um, the way that the season turned out as far as getting an opportunity to, to take our game into the playoffs. Uh, but it's time to hit the reset button um, and get back into our routine, uh, things that we've done over the over the course of the regular season to prepare mentally and physically for a game. And um, I think everyone's been able to get the uh, the juice and everything that was flowing uh, to the side now and, and get back to playing football. And like I said, we're, we're excited about this week, uh, but it starts with preparing, and uh, that's where we have to put our focus on. I'm curious about you, a season that wasn't storybook, didn't go exactly the way you wanted, but you will forever be the quarterback who ended the playoff drought in Buffalo. What is that like? What, is, what have those emotions been like? Um, be honest, uh, 
I've always thought that this team uh, could get to to this point. Um, I know the type of talent uh, that we had, and we've been close the last couple of years, but things just haven't won our way in, in a couple of games. Uh, but this team that we have this year uh, bonds like no other team that I've been a, been a part. And um, to see guys stay focused throughout the midst of the ups and downs throughout a season and to still have something to play for uh, the last week of the regular season game with a bunch at state and us to go out and play this type of game.